So everybody, welcome. Welcome to Speakeasy JS, the JavaScript meetup for mad science hacking and experiments. So mad science is all about pursuing your interests and doing things just because you feel like it and because it seems fun. Uh, so uh, today we're, we're going to be joined by our usual uh, panel of folks and our guest, uh, Hamank. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and bring them in here. So everyone say hello. Ew. Hey. Cool. So uh, hope everyone's doing well. Um, we had a couple weeks of, of no speakeasy JS for uh, various reasons. Uh, I had to do a hike on one of the days. Uh, and the other, the other one was canceled because uh, our speaker had a kid uh, unexpectedly uh, soon. Um, but uh, baby's healthy and it's all good. So uh, glad to be back this Friday. Uh, and you can join us every Friday at 4 p.m. at this time and uh, see uh, different JavaScript talks. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's introduce our speaker for today. So Hamanth is a uh, member of the technical staff uh, at PayPal. And he's also a TC39 delegate, which is what uh, is the most relevant for um, the talk that we're going to be hearing today. Um, so as a TC39 delegate, he works on JavaScript feature proposals. Um, and uh, he's going to be sharing with us some of his uh, some of the proposals that are coming up and some of his favorite ones. And then we're going to talk about them. Um, he's also the host of the TC39er podcast, which uh, I've actually checked out myself and I think is pretty cool. Um, and he interviews people on that podcast uh, who are on TC39. And so you can hear from different people who actually work on the JavaScript language spec, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, and the URL for that is tc39er.us. So check it out if, you, if that sounds uh, cool to you. And uh, last thing is a fun fact about him is that he is ambidextrous. And he says that he writes equally bad with both hands. <laughs> So uh, yeah, without further ado, uh, why don't you take it away, Hema? It's all the stage is all yours. Thank you, Ferris, and thank you, Paul, and hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for taking your time on a wonderful uh, evening here. And we will be talking about uh, JS next, the potential uh, future features, and I hope you are able to see my screen. So that's me, I'm Hemant. I'm uh, MTS at PayPal, and I'm also a Google developer expert for web and, uh, payment domains, and also a TC39 delegate. And you can hit me on at Blumant on Twitter. So basically, the question starts with what is TC39? Uh, so let's keep this session very interactive and not to make it like a one way talk. So, any guess on what TC39 is? Uh... I mean, TC39 is the group of folks who write the JavaScript language specification, right? Which is formerly ECMAScript. Yeah, but what does TC39 stand for? Oh, uh, I know this. Uh, it's uh, TC is technical committee. And I think that um, isn't the story that there's this organization somewhere in Europe, uh, which is, I guess that's what the EC part is. and. They're a standards group, and they have different standards that they're responsible for. And then this is the 39th one. Is that right? Yes, that, that's it. So it's just the 39th <laughs> technical committee. So as we have thir like 49 for programming languages and 12 for product study, 39 is for ECMAScript. Right? Nice. So that's where uh, the ECMA International, the European Computer Manufacturer Association International has uh, technical committees. And the 39th happened to be ECMAScript. So ECMAScript basically is the specification which uh, JavaScript implements. And there was also uh, Flex. The, if you remember, Adobe Flex was also one of the uh, implementers, uh, like if not completely, few of the parts of the spec, even ActionScript and unlikes. Wait, so so I remember Flex. Flex was um, Flex, Flex was this like thing where you could build uh, like UIs for business applications using it, right? Yeah, that was uh, actually extended from the action script part of it. So, oh, okay. So, is that responsibility of TC39 or a different group? Uh, no, TC39 just talks about the specification and the implementation is different. So, if you look into engines, say, uh, say browsers like Chrome, Firefox, and V8 engine and, and Node implementation, all the implementations would be different, but uh, they will be pretty close. The specification just talks about what the feature is and how it should behave and uh, what is the uh, 
uh, behavior and the method uh, that's there. But it doesn't really talk about how you're going to implement. It's left to the uh, implementers uh, a freedom to uh, implement in a way they feel is appropriate for their environment and which is more optimal for their uh, environment. Cool. So, so basically, uh, the, the phases there are there are these things called stages in uh, the uh, TC39 proposal. Uh, stage zero is called strawman, and there is also a proposal to rename it to straw person, and I, I hope that's going to happen soon. And uh, what basically happens in uh, stage zero is 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 not even like a formal proposal. It can it can be a tweet or it can be just a draft. It can be a readme or a just talking about the idea. And in stage one is basically a proposal that's presented to the the committee. So what ha what happens is there is the TC39 committee meeting that happens where all, there are uh, committee members and there are implementers and invited uh, um, guests also at times. And where uh, this 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 idea is basically a proposal is put forth in front of the uh, committee and they say hey this is what uh, the idea is all about and, and what do you think does it uh, look good or are there any nuances or will it break the web or not so that that being one of the main agenda that not to break the web uh, and and it's been it gets scrutinized pretty well and there are too many smart people in the room and uh, in one of the meetings uh, there was Brenda Knight too so uh, folks who have done a lot and uh, are super smart are uh, you know listening to the presentation the proposal and, and giving their uh, thoughts and suggestions and inputs and if everything goes well it gets proceeded to stage two where it's more like a draft so in this draft portion uh, people would say would go ahead and write uh, specifications to be on stage two but it need not be an uh, final spec but it should be a there should, there should be a spec talking about what are all the uh, methods or what is the feature all about and and that that's get reviewed on stage two and uh, stage four is more like a candidate where uh, at, if you see from stage zero to stage two it, it's not really like production ready but when you're on stage three it's more like candidate that that, that means you could still use it on production with caution at this stage most of the uh, engines would probably give it under a flag so if you want to try a feature, you would have to use it with a flag and enable it with a flag and try it out. And uh, their developers might can give feedback. And 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 finally, it's stage four. That means it's shipped. And it's, by this time, there might already be uh, in, implemented in human environments. And uh, once stage four consensus is reached, uh, it will be removed out of the flag. And it should be available for in uh, all possible uh, environments. One of the interesting anecdotes that I could talk about is uh, if you remember, uh, th there are uh, there was this proposal called flat flatten for the uh, flat in the RAM. Flat. What really happened was there was a Moo tool which was also using the same thing on the prototype, uh, and it kind of crashed the web. And uh, one of the delegates got super annoyed and uh, made a joke that we should probably call it Smooch and Smoochgate and all the thing that happened that most of you might have uh, you know come across in few many blog posts or tweet stops. So uh, yes, even though there are too many smart people in the room at, at times, uh, things like this happen, even that web has so much of legacy and there are always an edge case, but uh, it, it's it's very interesting to see the process uh, when uh, the proposals go from stage zero to stage four. And, and some of the proposals get held in uh, a particular stage for a pretty long time because it's not always easy to, uh, you know, not to overlook the uh, corner cases and some of the cases or corner cases, the edge cases that would have been brought up during these uh, meetings uh, would, would need a lot of time to solve. And some of them go inactive and some of them get replaced by a, another proposal, which is uh, kind of on the similar lines, but has um, more features to it. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yeah, so I always get um, a little uh, confused about like how seriously the different groups that work on different specs that make up the web actually take the backwards compatibility because um you know tc39 seems to take it really seriously because they didn't want to name this method flat um just because of this like one old library that was on a couple of sites like Flickr that couldn't be updated easily or or, or you know stuff like that and so they just renamed the whole thing right but then there's other changes that the browsers seem to make that uh break a ton of sites and it's like uh oh well you know like they're you know they'll they'll like they'll look at the usage and they'll see that, um, you know, that less than 
zero, you know, 0.2 percent of websites will break, and so they'll just ship it and say whatever, you know. And if you can, you can sort of follow along when you look at the, the mailing lists uh, where they where they'll and we'll, they'll talk about this. And um, I'm thinking of stuff like um, disabling uh, auto playing audio. Um, you know, that was a thing that broke a whole bunch of web games and a whole bunch of demos in the demo scene. And um, it, there wasn't an easy um, uh, fix, except for the, all those people had to go and update their games. Um, because if you, you know, if you tried to create an audio context before the user had interacted with the page at all, it would just fail. And then um, there was really like no way to fix it um, uh, without the making a code change. And so it just seems like a little bit um, strange in some ways if one group that's working on the web browser is making changes that break sites and then another group is taking it really seriously because at the end of the day like sites are going to break if, if not everyone is taking it equally seriously um yeah i don't know if you have thoughts on that or how the, yeah. how, how you think about it that's a very interesting question so with with uh, javascript especially we have the uh, test 262 uh, which is a mandate for all the you know the specs that get implemented to pass and the example you're quoting is more to do with the vendor because the vendor have the control. Say there is, I don't want to name the browser, say there are ABC3 browsers and each of them have their own implementations. And uh, the engines, in the, as a highlighted, the spec doesn't talk about the implementation details, right? Now, the, the, the example you quoted where you said, hey, the autoplaying or the mute uh, for the video. Uh, could also it's basically the vendor's decision, right? So if, if there is a there are a few browsers which just uh, goes one step ahead and doesn't really care about any web standard, but just go ahead and server side render everything and then spat, spit it on the client, so it seems faster for them on their mobile devices. There are such browsers too because there was no one stopping you to uh, go ahead and implement your own browser which doesn't care about any web standards. So. That's where it, it it gets complex, right? So with JavaScript, at least we know that the implementators are like folks. You could still go ahead and uh, write your own JavaScript engine, which which need not be adhering to the ECMAScript spec, right? You could still have its own uh, definitions and its own method, like how, for example, like how CoffeeScript started off. Right? And so with web, there is freedom, and with freedom, sometimes uh, things like this. Tend to happen, and, and 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 but the committee makes it pretty obvious to not to break um, any of the old features. Just just that's been the principle, and uh, everyone are mindful about it. So it sounds mm -hmm. like TC thirty nine takes it really seriously. Maybe some other players inside of web browsers don't take that backwards compatibility as seriously. Um, uh, it was Chrome that did the autoplay thing, right? They were the ones that broke it on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so different crew. So, so everybody do uh, spec normally on the spec. If you look into W3C or um, any other spec spec implementation, definitely they definitely take care of such things. But it is left to the vendors mercy to um, you know probably deviate a bit uh, at at few uh, at a, a few instances and levels. But if not completely, because as I mentioned, you could still write a browser which is completely not adhering to any web standards and still could go and render an, an URL. Right? So that freedom is there, which is both advantages and disadvantages at times. Right. Yeah, I mean, in, in this case, I think they were arguing that it was a, such a benefit to the user that it was worth you know, uh, putting them in their needs in front of the, the needs of uh, these these legacy or old unmaintained websites, um, which you know I understand the argument. Um, and there's a whole, actually a whole repo, if you're interested, if anyone's interested in this, um, there's a Thing you can search called interventions, and there's just a whole bunch of these sort of. They know it's a spec uh, violation, but they're like, we're going to ship it anyway because we think that it um, it is going to benefit the users more uh, than uh, the damage to not following the standards. Um, so it's it's very interesting when uh, that trade off is made. But anyway, I don't want to interrupt your talk anymore. Do you want to uh, keep going? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for the uh, digression. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for uh, for humoring me. No problem. So uh, here's a word of caution. Uh, we would be going through a um, few of the proposals, say around 10 proposals, and few of them might completely change. Few of them might not even make it to stage four, and few of them are almost on the path to uh, stage four. So let's dive into a few proposals and uh, see what's interesting in them. And I guess few of them you would have come across, and few might be new. Let's see. So here's the first uh, proposal I have. At the top right corner, I go ahead and mention what stage it is on. 
So this is on state zero. Uh, this is the function bind syntax. And say you have an iter lib which has map take while and for each methods in them. And today, if you were to do uh, something like this, you'd say, I want, I want you to get players uh, method and you get all the players and you have to map over the players and get the characters and uh, look for their strength attribute to be greater than 100 and pick them all and just go over them and, and console log in this case. And this is how we would probably do it today. You would say get player and then do a map.call on the value and uh, call the character method on them to fetch the character. And then again, do a, a you know take while and say the strength is greater than 100, get them and then block. But what if if it were to be more easier when you say you can bind the function in the con proper context and say uh, get players and use the uh, uh, you know this syntax here with double semicolons and say uh, get player map over the characters and uh, take while where strength is greater than 100 and do a for for each. And this looks so very uh, and neat and intuitive uh, for any of the readers. And this is on stage zero. That's the function bind syntax. And this is an interesting pattern uh, called pattern matching. And if you're if you have seen this in Rust or uh, similar languages, you might be already aware of uh, such a paradigm. Uh, let, let let me talk you or talk you through a simple use case. Uh, say you're uh, fetching a JSON service. Uh, in this case, you're doing an await fetch on a JSON service, and you get the result. Normally, when we go through the result, we would look for, uh, say, the status is 200, then we would have to probably say if everything's OK and go ahead and uh, you know uh, operate on the data. And if status is 404, we would say, hey, it's not found, and then we decide what to do. And the status might be greater than 400, it might be a request error. So instead of you going through an, uh, in a huge uh, branching strategy, you could say, my case is on the result, and when status is 200, and you could also go ahead and, uh, and strip out uh, content from the header. In this case, we are picking out the content length as S, and we are logging the size to be S. And similarly, for other cases, we could just do a case when. And similarly, here is an interesting case on JSX. Uh, you, you, you have, say, you have a component called fetch, and to which you pass in an URL, which is an uh, API URL. And on the props, you can put a case and then say, Hey, case on props, when loading, show the loader component, and when error, show the error component with error, and when data, show the page with data. Uh, isn't this like a uh, wonderful uh, proposal of uh, pattern matching? Is it all right if I jump in just to ask some questions about the proposals as we go, or would you like to save that for at the end? Yeah, we could do it either way. Uh, we have around uh, eight more proposals. and. Yep. Eight more proposals. Yeah. All right, well, then I'll, I'll keep it quick. It looks like that second usage shows the pattern match could work as an expression. So the value that it evaluates to gets more or less assigned to props in this case. Is that accurate? Yes. Yeah, that's a real neat feature. So, uh, yeah, that's super cool. Um, I'll, I'll save my question till the end of the proposals, but I, I just thought of one, too. So. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll hold off. No, well, I mean, I mean, if it, if it's a thing that's like relevant to what's the code on the screen, it might be easier to just do it as we go. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. So the other interesting proposal on stage one is uh, the pipeline operator. Uh, here's a uh, quick code snippet. Uh, say you were to do, uh, you have a string and you have to double the string and capitalize it and also add an exclamation mark at the end of it. So. Here, here are three methods, double the string, nothing fancy, just adding a comma and concatenating the string, capitalize, picking up the first character and capitalizing it, and exclaim, you add the exclamation mark at the end of the string. And today, this is how we would do it. We would you know, kind of nest all the functions and say, hey, exclaim, capitalize, and say, double say hello, and the result is what we get finally. And But we could do it much more intuitively and it looks softer on the eyes with the pipeline operator where you could say hello and then say hey double say and whatever the output of double say is an input for capitalize and whatever is the output of capitalize is an input for exclaim and the final return value goes to the result and what we have in result is same as we have above hello hello so you could just imagine the different use cases where you have Say probably have to do a validation, or you have to call multiple functions, and with the pipeline operator, it would get uh, more easier. Error cause on stage two. Um, I am a co-champion of this proposal. Um, the idea here is uh, 
say you you would have come across uh, such use cases definitely if you're uh, using uh, or if you're if you've done any uh, uh, javascript programming uh, is like say in this example you are doing an uh, fetch on a, on an url and if if there's an error it just goes to catch and you then go ahead and uh, throw an error saying hey there was this download writer of writer failed and that's when uh, again if you're putting it in a try catch block uh, here when you're trying to do the job the error is getting caught but the interesting thing about this proposal is how many times uh, in the stack trace you wanted to know when you're looking into the error what really caused this error right so the the proposal says hey what if we add a cause uh, attribute on the error and say hey whenever the error occurred i would i want to say, uh, say a new error and then give it a message and then give a cause so when you when you catch the error you, the error object has has this attribute called cause which says caused by this particular error in this case it says caused by type error failed to fetch and that's what we have populated here and saying hey it failed to fetch because of this particular error so this can help you in uh, knowing why why that error occurred and it also probably can help you in grouping such uh, relative causes like if you have um, have to group n, n number of causes for your analysis or reporting that this error occurred in this type of so it will help you to do all uh, error related activities which are bound towards the cost and it will make things easier and uh, i'll probably pass in a, a js fiddle uh, where you could go ahead and play with it and uh, happy to take uh, feedbacks on this I, I have a question on that one um i i just saw um a recent uh i think it's new in in i think es 2020 but there's a thing called aggregate error um, how is that different than this? Because I think aggregate error is basically like an array of errors that you turn into an error. Yes. Um, this seems like this is an error that can have like a another error as its cause, which I guess that one could also have another error as its cause in theory, and you could have a chain of them. But how do like when would you use each one? Yes, that's a very good question, and uh, I'm trying to find the chat area here if I could uh, pass the reference. Because this was the same question uh, that was uh, asked during the presentation uh, too. Uh, I am trying to bring it in the channel. Uh, I can I can paste this to everybody who's on the live stream. Okay. So so basically the key uh, the key difference between uh, those two the uh, the uh, aggregate error uh, is that the errors in the aggregate error does not uh, does not have to be uh, related to aggregate error or, or just like bunch of errors that just happened and to be caught and aggregated in one place that that can be totally unrelated for example you have a, a job a and job b uh, can 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 do anything and then probably you could say uh, or you do a promise dot all settled of job a and job b however if it's an error that's thrown from uh, several uh, layers deep inside the job a that has this cause this cause property can accumulate that and you'll have the context on where this error occurred and what was the cost and you would not really have that with aggregate errors right Okay, so, makes sense. Yeah. That's a good question. That was. Yeah. Uh, so okay, so uh, the other uh, proposal on stage one, uh, which I'm also co-championing uh, here, is uh, Did we just lose audio? string dnt. Um, le let me ask this question to for you guys. Like, uh, how many? of you have tried generating a program uh, from uh, from your program basically kind of a meta program or how many times have you tried to uh, console some uh, indented string uh, and then you noticed it was not really indented and you had to crack your uh, head a bit to get the indentation right uh, i hope a uh, few many of us would have faced that right so uh, with this uh, uh, proposal string dot uh, what do we have is a static method on the string it says hey string dnt here all uh, are all the strings that i have with this level of indentation here and i also want you to accept expressions and just go and evaluate uh, the string and the output should be maintained with the uh, indentation level if this is not the case today, then you would have probably started your template literal starting from the first line here and then go ahead and mark the indentations properly so everything is aligned. But with string dot dnt, you could just do it as if you're to, were coding in an editor with all the tab indentations. And when you go ahead and log it, uh, you would get uh, the same thing. 
Hope, hope my audio is clear. Yeah, it's good for me. I think Paul is having trouble hearing you, but um, you okay. just keep going ahead and he'll, he'll figure it out. <laughs> so this um, by the way, uh, actually, is uh, string event on stage one. A comment on this uh, on this thing on this proposal. There's a npm package that I uh, used to use that that uh, has a whole bunch of utilities for manipulating template string template strings in, in various ways. Uh, it could do things like the one that you just showed, ddent. I think they call it uh, something else. Um, and and then there's like one that will delete all the new lines and just make it into a single. Uh, uh, string. So if you wanted to do like a regular expression string, but you wanted to split it up into multiple lines for easy um, readability and stuff like that, um, you could you could do that and have the template uh, literal. Uh, I don't know if it's called a function, but the, the thing that is string dot dent in your example, whatever that is called, the, the function the function there that's being called, could go in and basically fix up the string for you. So um, that's really cool. Are you going to add? Are there going? Is there proposals to add other functions, different ones, or just dent for now? DN for now, if, if there is a use case where you're uh, uh, finding um, other functions uh, which are uh, pretty much useful out in the wild and there is no simple implementation for it, then it can be a potential proposal. So we could work on that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I think it, so the, mod, the module you're talking to was authored by either Jordan or Justin. Those are the popular modules uh, that's there, like it's dependent or uh, string dependent. Uh, is, is one of one of the popular uh, proposals and justin is uh, one of the co-champions here and uh, we got a lot for most of the proposals we get uh, very good feedback uh, from uh, jordan right yeah i think the uh, the name i think of the package is called common tags i think is the one common that i used so oh, yeah, yeah. But, i'll put put the url on the screen in case people are interested mm. okay. okay talking about the common tag i was uh, referring to the need and related uh, node modules. Yeah. So, uh, again, we have on stage one uh, await ops. So what basically await ops does is today, if you're doing a promise.all and you want to await on promise.all, you would probably have to do promise.all, map over each of the async functions, and then uh, do a promise.all for all of these. In this case, you are fetching profile ID and Things would get a bit easier with await ops because you could do await.all user.map of async functions. Instead of doing a user.map of async function and then running it through promise.all and then doing await, you could just do await.all. And similarly, you could do all, uh, because it's called ops, you could do all the operations that promise does. Like you could do await.all of expression, you could do await.raise, await.all settle, or await.any. Basically, promise.all, promise.raise, all settle, and promise.any. So this is our stage one. And stage two, this is a pretty huge proposal and this like really interesting proposal. Uh, it's called temporal. And I've just taken a tiny bit of from the temporal uh, as an example here. And you could see there are around like 15 different uh, methods there that's been uh, uh, listed. And it's a very uh, interesting proposal. And I think once temporal is out, most of the date manipulation and handling libraries wouldn't really be needed until unless you have a really an edge case. Uh, but with temporal, you can handle uh, you know plain date, plain times, and zone dates, and durations, and time zones, and calendars, and whatnot. And there was fun anecdote when temporal was proposed in the meeting. Uh, people were talking about, uh, hey, do we also need the need to you know worry about the Martian time zone? And uh, and <laughs> And there was one gentleman who who brought up a you know, calendar uh, use case. I'm not able to recall the calendar's name, but he said in that calendar particularly we have these many months and uh, the days varies a bit. And we, like we were all like like mind blown by the integrities that the the you know the committee brings uh, during the proposals. And here's an example where I have temporal dot plain date uh, from. And uh, Temporal has a very good uh, playground uh, where you could go through all of these methods and uh, have a look on how, how they work. And here you have temporal.plain date from, a particular, you can give a particular date and then start operating on the date. You could say date with two, with months is two. Now, if you see from uh, 2025, 31, we kind of went to 2022, 29. And, and we could also do date with months four or for reject. And, uh, this is just a snippet. So you, could, you have a lot of other operations, uh, which is definitely worth looking at. 
and it's on stage two. The other one we have on stage uh, two is uh, in place. Uh, I think it was named as absurd before and uh, recently got uh, renamed to in place in stage two. And things like this do happen when the proposal uh, is uh, named as X might end up being called as Y as progresses in stage. And uh, this is an example of uh, what, what basically happens if you're uh, operating with uh, maps. Um, Currently, you would have to do uh, three lookups to do something like this. The use case is you, you probably go and look into map if that has a key. If it's not, you will set the value with uh, value to that key. And then you would go and get the key and do something on it. But with m place, it gets very easy. You could just do map.m place key, insert the value, and do a thing. So instead of you doing those three lookups, you could just do m, m place. And basically, what m place does is it takes a key, it, it can do an insert, and you can do an update. So operating on maps gets uh, easier with in place. That, that's on stage two. And stage three is uh, top level await. Uh, with top level await, uh, this is a uh, very interesting uh, uh, feature. And I, I think lately, the top, top level await was advanced to uh, uh, stage four, if I'm not missing right, because it, it keeps uh, changing. And I'm, I'm like, as we are speaking, I'm like, Trying to quickly look into uh, if it got updated. Um, so it, it's still on stage three because it is uh, because I've been using it for uh, such a long time behind the flags. Even I was like confused a bit with it. It's already on stage four because I'm using it uh, day in day out. And uh, basically, what's uh, what's with top level await? If you're if you're using if you have used await or the keyword uh, with promise uh, while trying to await on something. You would have probably seen this error saying syntax error await it's only valid uh, inside a nothing function. And then you would go ahead and wrap that within a nothing function and then do an await of a promise, right? With top level await, you would not need this async function anymore. And you could just do await promise and it works fine. And this uh, is enabled for the modules. And uh, on uh, the node REPL too, you could uh, use it and, uh, with, with, with the flags. and. Uh, it's it's a very interesting uh, feature and it really change uh, the way we were uh, thinking about uh, async functions. And the interesting story here is uh, there was one gentleman who had written an uh, article saying uh, top level await is a put gun, and the the proposal uh, author uh, uh, for this was Miles. Uh, he was it uh, Miles when who's with GitHub now. Miles uh, and the uh, the author who, who said that uh, top level await is a put gun uh, kind of had a long discussion. Uh, basically, it's Rich Harris who wrote the uh, uh, article saying uh, it's a put gun. And then he went and uh, updated his article on uh, saying edit on Feb 2019, why he thinks uh, it, it is, it's a good thing. So things like this happen, which is with a good spirit, which is really good to see that developers uh, you know are open to express what they feel about a proposal and 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 they're also uh, they also come into agreement and consensus at time the way these these things are handled is, is is really good sign on how open the web is and uh, folks really don't take proposals personally and they just look into the code and uh, how it could benefit the entire community is what uh, everyone uh, interest is So uh, stage, this is a stage three proposal. It was called as item uh, till uh, stage two, and now it's called as add. So it's add on built-in indexables. So what basically add does is, uh, here's a quick example, right? You have uh, an array, and uh, you have to get uh, an element at zero at index. You could just do add zero, and you would get the zero at index. And if you do add minus one, you would be basically getting the last element in the array. So most of the time, you were to get the last element uh, an array without mutating it, you will probably look into the length and do a minus one and get the uh, last element, right? So uh, with add, you could easily get uh, the last or the first element. And if you give something apart from what's not there in index, it will not throw an error, but it will just give an undefined. So index will be converted into 0 for nan, null, plus 0, minus 0, or undefined. And same thing is apply applicable for uh, strings and uh, unit 8 arrays. So you could do the same thing for a string. You could say 0, or minus 1, or 100, and you would get appropriate uh, results. Yeah. And those were 
three set of proposals I had, uh, which were interesting for me. And there are many proposals, and it's all listed on uh, BTC39 uh, GitHub. Amazing. Awesome. <laughs> I think we should do a chat. Everybody should vote for their favorite on the list. And and definitely, <laughs> if, if folks have uh, uh, ideas which can be potential proposals, uh, we could look into it and uh, see out of those potential which can be presented. And I'm happy if that makes it to stage four. So th what's the best way to give feedback on these proposals? You just find the GitHub page and go open an issue? Is that how it works? Um, it's not really um, an issue. Um, uh, you, you, there is actually a, a, a discourse. Uh, I can let me try to find you that uh, site. But it is not. It doesn't basically work on issues. And um, you could. We have seen there are. There's no straightforward way of doing it. There are cases where, for example, error cause. Uh, one of the gentlemen had tweeted uh, this saying that, hey, it would be great if we could know exactly why the error occurred. Or Uh-oh. Oh, <laughs> we lost our speaker. <laughs> That's not good. Uh, uh, hope, hope he, oh, there he is. He's uh, back. OK. OK. <laughs> All right, <maybe> Welcome <laughs> back. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, I, I'm on fine that, uh, 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 I see. Anyway, continue where you left off. Yeah, where, where did I drop off? Uh, you said somebody was tweeting about the wanting to okay. have a car. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was a test. OK. <laughs> sure. So uh, it was basically, uh, there was a tweet which said, uh, it would be nice to see a cause on an error. And then there was a proposal that was picked out of that tweet. And uh, basically, there is a template for creating proposals. Folks normally fork that template and go ahead and uh, create the proposal. And if someone in the uh, TC39 uh, committee, all those delegates, would want to champion the proposal, they would pick that proposal and uh, go ahead and present it to the committee in the committee meetings. And if it makes sense, it gets advanced to the next stage, and then it continues. Right. So, there uh, a, so there's, oh, go ahead, Paul. I was going to say there's a good question in the chat about what's been going on with the pipeline operator. And I'm curious about this, too, because it's been in the pipeline for no pun intended, for a long time. <laughs> and uh, is it moving? What's going on with Pipeline? Yeah, so uh, basically, everything that's, that's been updated uh, will be on the nodes. So TC39, uh, basically, the uh, repo has the nodes along with the proposal. And the last we have heard in the meeting on the Pipeline was uh, probably like a year back, I guess. So there might be uh, multiple reasons why. Uh, a proposal might be held, and it might be at times the, the, the champions and the authors who have proposed are working on to figure out what are all the possible edge cases that might have occurred. And that is one of the reasons that uh, the pipeline uh, last update we saw was probably in March 2000, 2018, I guess. Right. So uh, if you if you go into the into the repo. Uh, it, it does talk about a few of the warning cases. And if you go into the issues uh, for the uh, pipeline operator, uh, there are a few open questions that, that's been uh, under discussion. And it need not be like, like we could point to, uh, to a single reason uh, for a few of the spec and say, hey, this because of this, it is blocked. There are a few specs with uh, such reasons where it's blocked just because of one single reason. And I would suggest you to go through the issues and then uh, we could talk more about what are all the different reasons that has resulted in such a delay. Hmm. Yeah. I could, There's uh, another qu question here about uh, if pipelines can play nice with uh, generators, so you could do stream piping. Any thoughts on that? You the question was stream piping. Yeah, could you use the pipeline operator on a stream potentially? Yes. Yes. No, nothing stopping you from uh, not using it. Right? It, it would operate on streams too. Interesting. Mm. Cool. Um, there was another question, which I think I can't tell if it's a troll or not, but they were asking sort of like uh, <laughs> when when <laughs> JS will defeat TypeScript. Uh, but I'm going to interpret this question as uh, like I didn't notice any type, uh, you know, optional type uh, 
in there in the proposals. Is there any discussion about maybe making uh, optional types a feature? Uh, yeah. There are no proposals, and I, <laughs> I, I I like the sigh there, the sigh of uh, of exasperation. <laughs> oh <you>. boy! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I could talk from the other uh, aspect of it. If you go to the TypeScript channel, it, uh, TypeScript's website, main website, it doesn't it doesn't anymore say that it is a it is a subset or it's a superset of JavaScript. It used to we used to read that right. TypeScript used to say that hey, we are uh, superscript of JavaScript. We no more see that. It says TypeScript extends JavaScript by adding types. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So no, it's no more. It's not like a competition anymore. It's not a competition between TypeScript and JavaScript. Right. right. It's, it's about something that solves your need. If TypeScript is solving your need, so be it. But it's closer to uh, JavaScript, and we have many delegates uh, who are working with TypeScript within the committee as well. So. Yeah. So I mean, I, I, the reason why I think the question still is interesting is that you know, CoffeeScript was never really a superset of JavaScript. It was always different, but uh, it still helped make JavaScript better because it inspired certain language features. The arrow <laughs> function is the one that's most obvious that comes to my mind. So um, you know, even if you know, even if TypeScript isn't um, you know uh, a directly superset anymore, I could still see that maybe JavaScript steals some of the good ideas from it and incorporates it into the language. Especially there is this decorator proposal uh, uh, that TypeScript already implements, but I think it's uh, whatever is implemented in deco uh, TypeScript is of a different stage, and decorator today is on a different other stage. There's a stage difference in implementation, and there was another uh, proposal with an uh, which was completely different from uh, the existing uh, decorator proposal. So definitely, yeah, good parts uh, are, are always being picked, and that's uh, that's a pattern. If you see the proposals, they normally speak about, hey, we see a similar pattern in Rust, F sharp, C sharp, Java, C plus plus, Ruby, and we are going to try and pick this. And one such example I can co quote is I am also working on this proposal uh, called uh, Array Equal. So the proposal started with equality. We were leaning more towards the spaceship operator of Ruby. If you folks are aware of a spaceship operator, it's it's more like um, uh, let me quickly try to pull it up. Uh, if you type it on your screen, I can show it to everybody. Uh, the screen that I shared previously. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So th this it's is the operator basically. So it it is also called as the three-way compar comparison operator. Kind of, kind of hard to see. Uh, oh, is it? Yeah. Uh, chat just got it. It's. Left angle oh, equals right angle, right? Got it. Okay, cool. Yep. Yeah, there it is. Something like this, right? So it basically compares two values and says if it is less than, greater than, or equal to. So the proposal that we had put forth was to have such an operator uh, because it it kind of helps you to uh, compare uh, values and and but uh, during the proposals it it kind of extended or it kind of Descoped or derailed a bit, and what we have today is array equals. So the the committee kind of felt that hey, we don't really see a need for this, but uh, checking if two arrays are equal is is a good use case, and uh, so the proposal kind of reshaped itself into an array equality today, and we are working on that. Uh, so things like these happen, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know that that brings a question to my mind. So, how do you decide between something whether it should be syntax or whether it should be a function? Um, because you know, uh, I saw like you added, you know, uh, or there's a proposal. One of the proposals you mentioned is uh, a wait dot um, ops. All, ops. Yeah, yeah. I don't have all the different ops. That you know, that to me, um, it. Uh, actually, it, that, you know, there's a lot of proposals that are in this vein where it's sort of like it's uh, syntactic sugar, right? And so. You know, you won't, you can't really use that in your code unless you transpile it or you wait until all the browsers that you care about uh, support it. Um, so, so uh, sometimes it seems like, um, you know, like um, I guess not worth adopting the syntax uh, right away if you're a user uh, waiting until it's until it's uh, more more supported. But I mean, if, I would imagine too, as a language, uh, as a specifier of the language, that that would also be an interesting consideration. Like, how, what? You know, because adding adding more um, different types of sort of syntax makes uh, arguably makes language a little bit harder for a newbie a newbie to learn because it's not exactly easy to Google um, you know symbols. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, 
So basically, uh, the, the implementers kind of have a high influence on whether a particular proposal should be a syntax or an operator, because at the end of the day, implementers are the ones who go ahead and implement the spec, and they have more details on possibilities and edge cases and performance bottlenecks and all of these that has to be considered. Uh, for example, string dot deed and what I just showed a couple of minutes back uh, is is a method on string, right? It's a static method. There was also in the proposal we proposed of having a triple backtick uh, syntax uh, right. rather than string dot deed end. But triple backticks might internally cause a lot of implementation uh, complexities and might also impact performance. And then string dot deed end makes more sense and it is more performant than uh, triple backticks, right? Uh, and plus, if you if you wanted to add more um, uh, different types of formatting uh, functions later, then uh, string dot dent and string dot et cetera et cetera, you know, is more easy to do than uh, four backticks, five backticks, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. At some point, you run out of syntax. Right. You can't really add an infinite amount. You run out of keys on the keyboard. Yeah. Until we start using Unicode. Uh, mm -hmm. cells. Uh, I think I think Pearl would disagree with you on that, but you know. <laughs> Right. I mean, I guess uh, one other follow-up question that I guess to this is, is, there seems to be a tension between making um, the language easier to e easier to do. Okay, let me let me let me rephrase this. Um, it seems like adding syntax uh, can can allow uh, the language to be more expressive, and you can accomplish more powerful things with less uh, co total code. Um, but the trade-off seems to be that. Um, there's more things you need to understand in order to like understand a JavaScript program that you might uh, not be familiar with that you're looking at for the first time. Um, and so um, maybe one way to think about it is like on the one extreme end, um, there's a language like C, which I actually personally like a lot, um, you know, ignoring the security uh, issues that come with writing C for a moment. The language of, of C is, you know, you can learn the whole thing in like a, in like a 40 page uh, book. There's like a, classic Kernahan, I think it's Kernahan uh, book. And it's like a beautiful book. You read it, you understand the entirety of the language. Of course, there's there's uh, a few things that you need to, you know, there's different interactions between parts of the language that you can't, that you won't learn fully until you start to use the language in your job and in your everyday. But as far as syntax goes, and as far as um, understanding the language goes, you can learn the whole thing in like a couple hours. Um, and then it's just about, uh, you know, how the different parts interact and the subtlety of ma manipulating memory directly is, that uh, what, is what occupies most of your time. But what's cool about it is when you um, w when you are working on a C code base, you're pretty much using 100% of the language every day. You know, you're, you use, use the whole thing pretty much um, like on a day-to-day -day basis. And then um, with like a language like C++ on the other end, you know, um, you could be a C++ programmer for, for like five or 10 years and then you go to a new company or you work on a new project and then you see a bunch of syntax you've never even seen before. So it's like quite crazy. You could be a really experienced programmer in C++, but you still don't even know how like, uh, you know, three quarters of the language even works because everyone is choosing a subset to use. And so those are like the extremes. And so um, what I'm seeing is as JavaScript gets more um, syntax over the years, is it's getting a little closer to C++. It's obviously not anywhere near it, but it's becoming so that, um, you know, a new, uh, uh, a new programmer might, um, you know, see syntax that they don't understand. Like for example, generators. I could see you you being a, a programmer for five years working on a on a JavaScript code base, and you never encounter a generator. You know, and then you switch to another team and another code base, and then suddenly, oh wow, what is this this generator thing? Or oh, what is this pipeline operator? You know, and, and so um, I don't know. It seems like uh, there's a little bit of a trade off as you add stuff. It gets a little bit harder for beginners, maybe, or maybe a little bit um, harder to to um, I guess less cohesive, maybe, but I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. Yeah, um, I would. I would see it in a different angle. Uh, I would treat it more like an uh, like an arsenal. You have a lot of weapons with you. <laughs> like you have to pick the one that's suitable for your uh, choice, and then you suddenly discover a different uh, you know entity, and you you would need some time to explore it and. Uh, compa comparing with the contrast where you gave about C and C++, it, the, the philosophy of where it was devised is completely different, right? They were more from the Unix philosophy where they said, do one thing and do it right, and which is good. And there's another thing where, uh, say, for example, Ruby, which says, hey, we give you like tons of operators and uh, you have the freedom to go ahead and even overwrite and everything is an object and we give the freedom to the developer. 
and there are a few like probably say java which says you it's always have to be public static void main like otherwise it doesn't be, or your class name and the file name should be the same otherwise it will not even compile <laughs> <laughs> right so for for every language i think there is a nuance and folks will definitely pick up as and when they uh, hit the hit those use cases it's not that uh, there is this joke which was floating around uh, on the net like few years back which said javascript the definitive guide which is like the 800 page book and the good parts which is like like 200 or like 180 pages right so just just for the fun but uh, yeah i think it's it's more like a double edged sword here and uh, it it is it's not that uh, it's not that you have to know everything uh, under the hood uh, even even uh, the spec editors wouldn't would have to sometime go and uh, you know read the spec and refer the sections and uh, you know reread it to make sure uh, the understanding is right so it it is complex and for a reason right no one no one expected uh, javascript to uh, you know grow to this extent and impact uh, in so many different areas may be even for internet of things or who knows even for quantum computing right so i think that level of uh, expression that the language gives us is what it's making it more powerful and alive and if you, if you if you ask me if you stick to your fundamentals of understanding uh, the concepts i think syntax shouldn't be a tough thing it should it will come to you naturally as you code more <clears throat> i'm a pretty big apologist for all the changes that have occurred i'm i'm strongly on board with a lot of this stuff so i i understand for us is a point but i actually am way on board with everything that's happened i mean going back to before async await i think i'd rather kill myself so <laughs> it's definitely been getting way way better um There's definitely a point where it could go overboard, but I don't feel like it's happened yet. Um, generators is maybe the best example of something that eh, I don't really use that often, except when you do the async generators, and then you get streams involved in that, and suddenly it's a whole new game. So um, I think there's still a little bit of room before we start having to bring up C plus plus, which you know, frankly, that's just rude. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah. I, that's why I said JavaScript is pretty far from that still, but uh, but I think it's a spectrum, you know. It, uh, and you know, I mean, ES5 is maybe the closest to, um, I think, like I think ES3, like before before you got to ES5, it, JavaScript was just painful. Like it wasn't like a didn't feel like a real language. Like the uh, uh oh, we lost our speaker again. <laughs> we'll come back. I guess he's. Uh, I'm guessing he's accidentally refreshing. the uh, tab um, that makes sense right? yeah let's see here okay he's back yeah um i was saying that um, you know es5 feel, felt like the first sort of point at which javascript was like complete and you could build uh for me like all the array methods and stuff which i think came in es5 that was like really important for it to feel like a useful you know language out of the box um and then um uh so i think that's probably like the c the part like the the part of the point in time in which it was like the most like c and then uh now now i think we're we're going getting getting a little bit uh um to the point where you have to pick and choose the subsets of the language that you want to use but i mean maybe a counterpoint to all the things i'm saying is that um you already have to kind of do that with javascript because we already have you know the bad parts that you're not supposed to use which we've already like we've forgotten in the sands of time like the with keyword and there's all these parts that that we don't use anyway that so yeah. so like it's not that 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 weird that we're just as we add new things and we other things become the old way and the not as easy way to do it that we just leave those behind and um eventually the the memory of how those things work just gets lost and most programmers don't even encounter it right mm -hmm. and in fact like the linters you know like the standard js project i work on will just ban certain features like just don't even use that like there's no reason to use that so it's like you yeah, know maybe this is actually fine yeah that that reminds me of this quote i don't remember who said it first they said they said that uh, programmers are uh, telegraphers of 21st century so we all will be replaced by something better and someone better <laughs> until that we just have to enjoy the ride gpt3 is coming for all of us <laughs> uh you know the uh one thing that's sort of interesting actually about this i think the problem the move to promises and async await um generally speaking th there may be some cases where correctness got worse for people because of unhandled rejections being a little bit easy to swallow but overall i would say that moving from the callback management life to the promises management and the async await patterns has probably reduced bugs if i if you had to if you ask me i think that's probably been the case 
So some of this stuff, you know, I, I knew people that became just complete wizards with ES5. They loved that C kind of vibe that you're talking about. And uh, I, I saw what that looked like when you were good at it, and it never looked as good as ES6 and on. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sticking with the future point and on this one. I think you're romanticizing the old ES6 days, or ES5 days, rather. I, I mean, I don't know. I had a style that I thought was pretty good, if I do say so myself. <laughs> the, the, trick, the trick is, the, really, the real trick with ES5 is you have to uh, name all of your functions. So you, if you're doing like a thing that has a callback that, that does some other stuff and then has another callback and another callback, you don't want to nest it and get the pyramid of doom. But if you name all those functions and then you just uh, always uh, pass in the name as the callback, then uh, and, the, and then the other cool trick you add to that is you order it because uh, the functions, if you use function uh, named functions, they all get hoisted to the top. So you can actually right. uh, order, order them in the order that, that they're actually going to execute in. And then it becomes like this nice thing that you just read it you know, vertically, which is the thing that everyone loves about async await. So I'm not hating on async await. I love it too. I'm basically on board. But, uh, but I think sometimes people are unfair to, to the callback style and they use these sort of contrived examples which, um, you know, I never had that in my code, in any of my code, because I, I did this sort of named way that was really nice. So, yeah. Or, yeah. or, or we can go the point-free way. The, the functional programming paradigm talks about point-free programming, which is, uh, uh, it's worth looking into. I, I kind of maintain this repo called uh, FP jargons, where I kind of go ahead and try to explain the uh, functional programming jargon concepts in JavaScript, because the function programming talks a lot of math concepts and uh, trying to uh, trying to simplify it with uh, simple JavaScript examples is the effort that we did here at uh, function programming. Yeah. Cool. I just put the link on screen for people if they're interested. Oh, it's in the chat. Um, cool. Yeah. Did you have any other questions, Paul, or did you see anything interesting in the chat that you wanted to bring up? Oh. Um. I'll, I'll bring up one. Um, the bind operator and the uh, the pipeline operator are kind of similar. Uh, do you think they're both going to land? Do you have any kind of indication as to whether or not they're going to compete with each other? There might there might happen. There might be a third one too. Oh really? So so yeah, they're similar, but the use cases that they're solving is a bit different. When we read through the proposals, uh, the intent behind uh, bind. Uh, versus the pipeline is a bit different, but mm. syntax, by, by the syntax sugar, it might look like the same, but the, the intent and the implementation would vary a lot, and they they might seem like competing uh, proposals. And, uh, as I suggested, there might be something uh, different that might pop in, which might replace like uh, how we saw the at, at on uh, indexables uh, kind of uh, replace. There was a there was a proposal on string uh, prototype dot item, uh, and it was called string prototype dot add, uh, which got replaced by uh, the add on on all the indexables. So it will also operate on uh, unit eight arrays or normal arrays or strings, right? So this proposal is uh, replacing the other one. So other one is kind of uh, deprecated now. Here's another question for you. There was some conversation for a while about a kind of module based standard library. Uh, move where um, mm -hmm. I believe it was the STD would STD, be the KB yeah. store was one of the examples, right? There, there, there is no traction as of that. Uh, the last we heard was of three or four, um, four, four or five meetings ago on the committee where um, people, uh, even when it was first proposed, it was just an experimental feature. So it is not has not been like. Uh, it was not implemented in many places. What I remember was Chrome had it in under flag for KV store, and there was one yeah. more standard lib, and it hasn't really uh, taken off uh, after that stage. Are import maps under the TC39? Uh, import maps aren't. Uh, I could see that actually being in the web platform stuff more than TC39. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I see a question that's uh, actually uh, quite a nice one. Is uh, is there a proposal for a non-mutating version of array.sort? That would be really handy. Uh, not really. I think uh, this was brought up uh, in a few occasions. And uh, it, again, it goes back to the principle of not breaking the web, right? Like now, we have, when you have sort, it will give a 
a sortable uh, function to it and you could dis have a logic saying that if it is less than or greater than that's where the spaceship operator would have been useful to where you could say to the comparator i would just pass in this uh, spaceship operator on on have or have it defined on the symbol uh, prototype and we can just use it and the the natural sort order would have been maintained and if you're again sorting strings then you would have to do a local compare right so all of these uh challenges would occur and wait so why why couldn't you just name it something different like a uh, you know dot uh instead of dot sort maybe like dot sorted or something yeah we could we could bring that up as a proposal but i feel there's a high chance that it wouldn't really be accepted so most of the patterns i've been observing on how proposals you get through is based on uh, what is the use case basically you're trying to solve and how is it solved today and with this proposal how could it get better and would it break something so these are like the general questions uh, that would go through right like what is that we are achieving if we just add uh, or sorted now there was another proposal which said uh, the the author said i'm confused by the term filter when you do a filter on an array, are you say like say you're you have a blue filter? What does a blue filter do on a camera? Will, will it let the blue light out, or will it filter everything apart from blue light? Or 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 you say you're filtering coffee. What, what are you filtering there? Like, what, is it the coffee that goes through, or the coffee stays there? What the the, the, the proposal author said? I'm confused with the term filter. And most of the uh, committee said that hey. Uh, the argument went through on these lines and most of them were alluding to the fact that it's been there for all these errors and folks have been uh, used to and know how filter work and operate now why should we change it yeah yeah i mean that just seems pointless to to change at this point i mean uh it's like basically adding another method that just flips the true and false like direction would just be confusing but um yeah, I guess, I guess, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I guess the way you accomplish uh, mutable sort today, uh, I, I would guess is you just clone the array first and then you uh, call sort on it. And then you're now not changing the original array. Is that right? Yeah, you can do a, uh, you can do a spread operator. So you just get the copy and yeah. yeah. Well, the question was more on mutability. Sorry, I, I thought about maintaining the sort order. Oh yeah, yeah. It was mutability. That's why I was confused by your first answer, but it's all good. Okay. <laughs> I, I got one more for you. Is there any um, anything going on with perhaps a deep clone? Yeah, yeah. there there was a proposal, but that that was uh, that had limitations. And I think this uh, I'm trying to. It was called deep clone itself. I think the proposal was brought out more in terms of how uh, the virtual the the React virtualization uh, operates. Right? They have they go ahead and uh, clone the entire DOM and then do the DOM diffing part. So it yeah. was more uh, from those algorithms. And uh, it, it it was it wasn't accepted for long reasons. I can I could share that with you. So you think another shot at the proposal might have a chance? I would doubt because people would definitely go ahead and refer to that and say, hey, look, here's a similar thing and this is what happened. And we uh, we also were mindful when we were proposing the uh, uh, the equality operator and we were expecting that hey uh, this proposal might come up and uh, how 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 is equality different on this and uh, uh, things like that so so most of the people in the committee are aware of various numbers of proposals that made and didn't made and the reasons behind it and they were able to you know relate to it very quickly right well, it's not every day you get a chance to talk to somebody on TC39 and ask all your questions and uh, uh, advocate for your pet uh, proposal ideas. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, to uh, hear from you and to let us uh, ask you our questions and for the for the viewers in the chat as well to get a chance to ask their questions. That's super nice of you. Thanks for having me here. And uh, definitely uh, anyone who has uh, things they have a potential proposal can like hit me on Gnu Month on Twitter and probably we can take it to the next level. Nice. Um, and how do you spell your handle? G-N-U? M-A-N-T-H. M-A-N-T-H. OK, yeah. great. Um, I'll, I'll uh, show that on the screen here in a sec, and then people can follow you if they'd like. Cool. Thank you. Um, nice. So, uh, so I guess now I'll just uh, mention we're going to switch to a social uh, portion of the event. So if you want to hang around and talk to the 
so the um, speakers and, the, and me and Paul are going to hang around for a bit. Um, you can uh, go ahead and here, I'll put the instructions on the screen.